Hey there, I'm Eric Magidson, and I'm going to walk you through a series of videos that prepares you for the CompTIA Network Plus certification. So we're going to start with a basic networking overview. Uh, again, we'll get into these topics in details in sub-lectures, but let's get started. So today we're going to look at what makes up a network. So we're primarily focusing on the components or the physical topology of a network. Uh, no network versus a network, so we'll explain what the differences are. Overview of types of networks and key terms. So as we look at what makes up a network, what makes up a network are computers and devices. So as you can see there, you know, not just laptops, not just desktops, but our smartphones, our tablets, you know, things like that, that can connect, i.e. they have a device, a network interface device, that allows them to connect with a network, okay? Network nodes and hosts. So when we talk about hosts, we're talking about the devices or computers that are connected to the network for the most part. And again, the nodes would be the equipment that makes up the internet in which traffic flows over. So this is gonna be our hub, switch, routers, you know, Wi-Fi access points, those kind of things there. As we look at network interface card, there's a couple different types, uh, wired and of course wireless. Okay, so I've given two examples of wired network interface cards here. This one with more ports would be for a server so that we can create redundancy, uh, team these together, create faster throughput, etc. Uh, the way that all of these connect is through some sort of cabling or, as we know today, wireless. With current wireless being uh, Wi-Fi 6. Okay, most of you probably have 802.11ac or 802.11n or maybe even back to 802.11g. Now, if those uh, terms don't make sense, don't worry. They will as we go through this series. But physically connecting a network would be through twisted pair. You would know this as Ethernet cable, Cat5, Cat6, you know, Cat7, Cat8, <laughs> just kidding, uh, or fiber optic. Now, of course, fiber optic is you know, much, much faster. Again, we'll talk about these. This can only run for 100 meters. This can do 1,000 meters generally, which means sometimes even in businesses, we have to use fiber optic to connect certain portions of the network. And today, pretty common is Wi-Fi, at least for connecting devices and computers or computers and devices is wirelessly. So that makes it easy for us to travel with our device, take our laptop into a meeting room, back into our office, etc. Now, what makes all this work are network protocols. Think of these as network rules, okay? And as you can see, there are these seven rules here. Application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and physical. And they all do their own part in allowing us to communicate, basically sending ones and zeros or sequences of ones and zeros over the physical media, okay? and to create software, et cetera, you know, uses a lot of these um, layers as well. So we'll talk about these as well in a later lecture in detail. Computing without a network. So back in my day, as you can tell, I'm old. Back in my day, uh, we did what was called sneaker net. There was no connections between computers. So what we did is we um, saved information onto a floppy disk, five and a quarter, or you guys may know the, um, what, what is it, three and a quarter? I think it's three and a quarter inch floppy disk. And we would sneaker net or walk it over to another computer and load the data there. So this was hugely inefficient because that meant that any sort of peripheral devices like printers that we needed, we needed one connected to each computer, okay? Now, I even remember an office where computers weren't connected and there was a regular, an older computer that sat there connected to the printer. It had all the applications. People would go load their file and print. Hugely inefficient, especially today. We couldn't do that today. So when we talk about computing with a network, we're talking about sharing resources, okay? Whether those be files, transferring emails, messaging, social media, even streaming media like our Netflix is capable because of a network. So as you can see here, these computers can share different printers. Maybe this is a uh, inkjet printer or a color printer, and this is just a black and white laser jet. 
which means if we're printing black and white, we'd print it here because it's cheaper. Uh, with the connection of a network, we're able to connect to the internet and thus the World Wide Web, connect to shared databases and shared files or shared storage. So this works out really well and you can see why networks are popular. And of course, if you have two computers in your home, you've most likely created a network. So let's look at just some of the basics about types of networks. Now, point to point, or as we refer to it, peer to peer, can be as little as two computers that are connected together, that can share information back and forth. Maybe one even has a printer and the other can use that to print. Okay, so peer to peer networks. Now, <coughs> peer to peer networks, for the most part, are pretty inexpensive. You know, there's not much planning. We connect two, and then suddenly here comes another, and we connect it, and we have this little network growing, okay? They are pretty simple. Microsoft Windows has basic networking built in. You might have seen the work group network. So you can connect computers that are on the same network to that work group and thus create a peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, disadvantages, you know, dispersed data. The challenge is I might have data here, data here, data here, and then suddenly if someone here wants to access data, they gotta come over here. There's also the fact, and something we really should talk about right off the bat, is backing up data. We like to have data in a central location, as we'll talk about in the client server, so that we're not backing up each and every one of these computers. We're backing up the data where it sits on a server, okay? So again, and talk about management. If a user here wants to access information here, this user has to have an account on this computer and on this computer and thus be given permissions. So if this user needs to access all these computers, suddenly I have to create one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight user accounts to make that happen, okay? In the basic old peer-to-peer -peer network. So what works better is a client server network. This is where our devices or our computers connect to a common server and that server serves like a server would in a restaurant, serves you the information you need. They can serve emails, they can serve websites, they can serve intranet sites. Again, if this terminology you're going, oh my gosh, don't worry. We're gonna get into the details in a later video. Okay, advantages, very scalable. We can just add more, add more, easy to support because we're not suddenly having to really focus on supporting as, as I said here, adding users and permissions all the time, we're adding users and permissions back here based on what's called a network operating system. Uh, data protection in that data is stored in one place or maybe on two or three servers or four or five servers, but it's not stored on the thousand of devices that we have, okay? So if this computer goes bad, we don't care. Our data is here and we want to back up our data and especially today with ransomware, we want to have a backup system that is disconnected from our primary or production system so that if this server gets hit with ransomware, we know we can restore it from data that hasn't been compromised. Disadvantages, it is expensive, servers are expensive and we have to plan. At that point, we really need someone who understands and that's what you're learning right now is to understand how to do this. So types of network topologies, that point to point that we talked about are peer to peer. A bus network, this is where computers are all connected on this central wire called a bus. Here, computers are connected in a ring, which means each computer has an input and an output and data flows like this until it hits the computer it needs and it says, hey, I've got data for you. Are you the computer? Nope. Are you? Nope. Are you? Nope. Are you? Yep. And then the data stops flowing. So you can see how this can really fill up a line. Okay. And again, these are old technologies. Now, when we get into a star technology, we're talking more about a hub. Now there's a hub and a switch. What a hub used to do is the same thing as a ring. Each of these ports on the hub, it would say, hey, is this data for you? Nope, move on. Is the data for you? Nope, move on. Is the data for you? Yep, it is. And so you can see that still is very inefficient, okay? 
A combination of these is a tree or what's called a hybrid tree or a star uh, tree bus. And that is we have a main bus that we connect other tree networks to. Okay, so this, the sorry, let me catch my breath. This is really a tree bus that's being shown versus a tree. Okay, a tree would be like this and maybe a computer here and a computer here. But you get the idea, still connected with hubs, in which case data would flow to this hub and to this hub, looking for who the data is supposed to go to. That's when we started to get into mesh. Now, when we talk about mesh, that's what we're used to seeing today. Two types of mesh would be a physical mesh topology where we're connecting most likely with Ethernet, okay, uh, Cat5, Cat6 wiring or fiber optic wiring. And all of these computers would be connected to a switch. Now, the cool thing about a switch is instead of asking everybody who needs the data, it knows via the packet where the data needs to go. So it routes, I'm sure you've heard of a router, it routes the data. So computer A can send information right to computer C. It doesn't have to go to B to C and all the way around, okay? Now again, we'll get into this in more detail. Hybrid would simply be a combination of those, of different types of networks. So what makes all this work is an internet protocol or IP address. Every device on our local area network, which we'll talk about, needs a unique IP address. Every device that's on the internet needs a unique routable IP address. And as we'll learn, we ran out of, we're running out of IP version four addresses, so we're going to IP version six, okay? Which means we're never gonna run out of addresses, at least not in my lifetime, we're not. So as you can see here, this host has an address, this router has an address, this server has an address. All of the things that are routed over the internet need a routable IP address. Inside our network, we tend to reuse IP addresses and have what's called a gateway that connects all of our computers in our network out to the internet. So all that traffic is flowing over one common IP address out to the internet. So an internet protocol address is a numerical label, as you can see, it's made up binary, eight bits, four octets for a 32-bit IP version four address. You might remember an address or one if I said that was familiar, 192.168.0.1 or 192.168.1.1. That's a class C IP address and it's pretty common on the equipment like your wireless routers that you buy today. Now what we can do is we can subnet those addresses creating what's called a subnet mask so that we can actually create more networks within a network, okay? So by subnetting, we can expand networks, okay? We can also reduce networks down uh, so that we don't have a ton of IP addresses. So don't just think about using subnetting to create many networks. Think about using subnetting to reduce the number of IP addresses that may be um, available on a network, okay? So I give you an example here of that 192.168. What I did is I subnetted it. You're probably used to seeing a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. That's a non-subnetted or a single subnet, okay? Which means 254 uh, IP addresses can be given, okay? Essentially. I know if, if you're used to this, you're going broadcast. What about broadcast and all that? 254, cool, broadcast, we know. If I wanna subnet that into two networks, I'll use two bits to do that. That'll create four networks. And then I get a list of what my host range will be, okay? Notice if I didn't subnet, my host range would be zero, one, which is usually the gateway, to 254. So local area network is essentially this. You see one here, you see one up here. This might be something like what you have in your house. now. They're showing hubs. Today, hubs don't really exist. We don't use them anymore. This would be a router with a built-in switch, okay? So this is probably similar, without the server, 
to your network at home. And a local area network is simply that. It's a network that is comprised in a limited area, whether that be a building, a residence, a school with a few buildings, a laboratory, university, campus, office building, etc. It's going to be in one geographic location, and that's, that's the key there. As we grow the network, we might take many local area networks and combine them into a metropolitan area network. So as you know, Google has offered metropolitan Wi-Fi in certain cities where they've gone in and created a Wi-Fi network over a city, for example, okay? And by doing this, uh, you know, everything on the network is connected. So suddenly this office building could be connected to the campus, could be connected to government. Now we don't see a lot of these because today we don't want this huge connected network that everybody can get on. We want security and we want a segment, okay? But this gives you an idea. We can have many local area networks all connected together in a larger geographic area. Finally, a wide area network is usually a network that's gonna utilize the internet for traffic, okay? So you see this cloud here that's representing the internet. And so basically, if we have a corporate office in Dallas, Texas, and in Bend, Oregon is our data center, we're able to communicate wide area utilizing internet protocols to transfer data. And then what we would do is secure these areas here with these things right here called firewalls so that only data we approve can get into each local area network. Finally, there is the big I internet, not to be confused with the World Wide Web. Now, I gave you an example up here. You know, this might look like nerve endings or something, right? But it's, it's a representation of the internet with every single point that's left having a unique IP address. If we're talking about IP version 4, we're essentially talking about 4.29 billion, with a B, IP addresses, okay? And we'll talk about, wait a minute, there's more than a billion things. There's more than 4.9 billion Internet of Things devices now. So we'll talk about how we then bring those down into a local network utilizing or reusing class A, B, and C IP addresses. So here's a great example of the Internet. The Internet are the interconnected computer networks. So keep this in mind, okay? This is the TCP IP to communicate between networks and devices and it is the physical layer for the most part. Okay, now each device has software and operating system, but what we're talking about are the routers and the switches and the firewalls and the gateways. What travels over them is internet communications, and that's World Wide Web communications, websites, emails, intranet, you name it, even voice over IP, you know. Voice over IP, I can have a... Um, corporate office in one city and give a, a phone system and connection to other offices so that we're all literally connected with um, extensions that look like we're centrally located. Now, unlike the internet, which is large, you know, the biggest network in the world, an intranet is a computer network for sharing information locally. So a lot of times when we think of intranet, if you've worked for a large company, they probably had an intranet website where you could do things like manage your human resources account, create profiles, communicate with other people, talk about tasks. This is an intranet. And the idea behind an intranet is to organize a company's data, organize the access to it. Okay. So as you can see up here, intranet is comprised of access and collaboration and data and communication, it is a private network and information flows. Now that doesn't mean that we can't open our intranet out to the internet, okay, and allow access for employees outside, but it's still considered an intranet. Finally, there is a thing called an extranet. It's a controlled private network that allows access to partners, vendors, suppliers, or authorized set of customers. So a great example of an extranet would be Walmart. Walmart connects their network, right, via internet available servers that sit outside the network. Only these servers can connect to inside the network, for example, to customers, to vendors, um, you know, et cetera. So if you want to do business with, with uh, 
Walmart, you have to be running their supply chain software so that the data can flow in in real time as to when you're going to deliver the products that they're buying from you. So here's a nice little graphic I like. You know, here's your business. The intranet comprises inside. The extranet can be both inside and outside. So that's it for now. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. Take care.